All right, so we're in the shop today working on the bicycle generator. Um, this is a, let's see. So this is off of a um, Kurt Kinetic road machine. And uh, as you can see, I've taken off the end plate here. Uh, I chose this unit because it's got a flywheel built in, which is pretty cool. I saved the fluid unit here. So this is just a bolt, bolt apart deal. I haven't broken anything. I could, I could always reassemble it into a working Kurt Kinetic road machine and sell it or ride it or, you know, whatever I want to do. But the point is I'm trying to mate up this uh, Turnigy 192 kV uh, motor, RC brushless uh, DC motor with the Kurt Kinetic road machine. I'm gonna make a bicycle generator. Anyway, so in order to do, to do that, what I've done is I've, I've made this adapter plate. So if you don't know about the, uh, the Kurt Kinetic Road Machine, it's got this plate on the top here. And uh, as you can see, that, that part can rotate. So the wheel comes in contact with this part right here. So this whole assembly is going to be rotating on the bike. It's actually more like this, right? So as the wheel t contacts right here, this assembly rotates, so you can see that that end piece rotates. So, the you know the claim to fame with the Kurt Kinetic is that the uh, the fluid unit will not leak because there is no mechanical mating between uh, like it doesn't use O-ring seals that'll wear out or anything. Instead, it uses a stationary seal uh, that won't wear out, at least not as often or frequently. And it uses magnetism, these, uh, these rare earth neodymium magnets, to uh, translate the force from the roller through to the fluid unit. So I could have used neodymium magnets to drive my, uh, my motor, but, and you know, that would be a perfectly acceptable solution, I suppose, but it's got these handy dandy holes right here. And, uh, you know, I just figured why use magnets when I could just use a, a real mechanical connection. You know, I don't have fluid to worry about, so there's no reason for me to go through all the trouble of sourcing neodymium magnets. You know, I, I would much prefer to just 3D print apart, bolt it on, and be done. Um, so anyway, this was, I, as you can see, I went through a number of different prototypes. Each one of these took about five and a half hours to print with my shitty uh, hobby-grade 3D printer. Um, this was the first one that I did, and as with most of my, my prints, the... Uh, you know, I measured these holes with a, with a caliper. If you don't know what a caliper is, this is a caliper. I just have a shitty ass little <laughs> Harbor Freight deal. And you know, you just, you put the caliper into the holes, right? And then you get a reading on the LCD. And that one, it's really hard to read, but it says eight millimeters, almost, almost exactly. So uh, yeah, you know, I, I read, I record all of those measurements and I put them into a file and then from that, from those measurements, I build uh, 3D model parts and then I send them to the printer. And so inevitably, every time I do this, the first part that I send, uh, the 3D printer isn't calibrated properly or something. I don't know. And you know, my holes end up being too big. So like this is exactly eight millimeters in the file, but when it prints out, it's too big to fit in there. So what I did is uh, I just, I use like an adjustment percentage, like 0.1% or something, and 0.1% uh, fits in there pretty well. Uh, that's actually 0.2% on this part, but this part's 0.1%. And uh, yeah, so that was, that was prototype number two. And this is ideal because it's entirely 3D printed, but the thing that I don't like about it is uh, 3D prints are weakest along these lines. Okay, so hopefully you can see, you know, the striations or lines or whatever you want to call them there. These are actually the layers. So as the 3D printer is, you know, making this part, it, it makes it one layer at a time. So it builds it up from here at the bottom and it builds it up this way as it goes, right? So you end up seeing these lines, particularly in, in my 3D printer's case, you see them pretty pronounced because, uh, you know, it's a shitty printer and it doesn't have very good uh, control of the X and Y axis. So you end up seeing a lot of ridges there. Uh, but anyway, so shear strength this way is very weak in these parts. They tend to separate right on these lines here. So these nubs in particular are very weak because 
sheer strength, you know, if you're twisting on this, these, these little nubs will come off pretty easily. At least that's my, that's my, my theory. So what I've done is rather than, um, rather than rely on the sheer strength of the, uh, you know, the layers in the 3D printed part, I thought maybe I'll, maybe I'll put wooden dowels in here and, and that'll give me more strength. So I went out and I bought uh, wooden dowels and um, they, I think these are 5 sixteenths wooden dowels. Anyway, they fit right down in there. I figure I'll, I'll chop them off so that I've got a little bit of a nub sticking out. And these wooden dowels will be fairly mechanically strong. I, I don't know if it's going to be, I haven't calculated the torque or anything, so I don't know if it's going to be, you know, strong enough to actually withstand the forces that I'm going to be putting on it, but I think it, it stands a much better chance of surviving than if these were just 3D printed nubs. As you can see, the 5 16 inch dowel fits in there as well. Okay, I guess I can talk about uh, how this is mounted to the motor a little bit. Uh, so this is just an RC hobby motor. It's a Turnigy Aero Drive 6374, so 192 kV. And uh, I believe I had originally bought this for making an electric skateboard, um, but the torque specification didn't end up working out the way I wanted it to at the RPM that I needed. So I'm just attempting to repurpose this into my bicycle generator. I mean, it's probably not an ideally sized motor for the job, uh, but I'm not quite sure how the math works when you turn a, a motor, especially a three-phase motor like this, into a generator. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd wing it and I'd put one in there and I'd see how the voltage and everything worked out. I've got a Midnight Classic uh, wind MPPT controller here. So I just thought I would, you know, See, see how things go. But anyway, so this is, a, uh, this is primarily intended to be a large prop motor, I believe. And I'm actually, I'm using a prop adapter right now to seat that. So the way this works is I got a, I got a 17 millimeter deep socket here. I, I just bought this, I picked this up at uh, eight, uh, AutoZone because I don't know, I, I've got a, a number of deep sockets, but I didn't have one that was 17 millimeters. It was just an odd size, so I had to buy that. Um, but anyway, so there's just a little nut on the end here. I think this is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, when you, when you hear about people making electric cars, little project cars, or, you know, even just backyard mechanics like you know, changing, changing an engine out or something with like a larger engine. You always hear about like motor mounting plates and mounting adapters and stuff like that. But it, you know, anytime you ask somebody how one of those is made, uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard to get a straight answer because they're complicated, I think. So in this case, I decided this, this prop adapter, it just slides right off. There we go, slides right off. And so it's made of a collet um, the collet clamp, bottom clamp, and the collet top clamp here, and then a nut to tighten it all down. Give you a little better view of the, uh, the prop adapter here. So there's the collet, and that just slides on the eight millimeter shaft. And then this piece uh, is the bottom part of the prop clamp, and this piece here is the top part of the prop clamp. And the nut drives the top part down onto the prop, and then it drives the bottom part down onto the collet and that, you know, clamps the, uh, the motor shaft. So it's kind of an ingenious, if you've never seen a prop adapter, it's kind of an ingenious little thing. This actually comes with the motor, by the way. This is a, I, I didn't have to buy this or anything. It comes with that Turnigy uh, 192 kV motor. So the 3D printed part and the wood are the only things that I'm buying here. And the, and the 17 millimeter deep, deep socket to, to tighten down this nut. And so, you know, when you, when you put it down in here, um, there's, a, there's a certain thickness of this part that it just clamps down on like a prop, you know, just like a propeller for, a, for an RC plane. And it just clamps down on it and uh, keeps it in place. So hopefully, hopefully I don't crack the, the plastic parts, I don't know. But see, I didn't know any other way, I don't have like uh, metal working tools really. I don't have like a lathe or a, you know, CNC mill or anything like that, or even just a regular mill. I've got some woodworking tools and I've got a 3D printer, so I had to kind of work with what I had. I would have loved to have just made a, um, you know, an aluminum 
uh, adapter that fits on this eight millimeter shaft and has like a little uh, set screw to tighten it down. And I think if, you know, if I had machine shop tools, that's probably how I would do it. And then there would just be one adapter, but you know, working with what I've got, I'm just, uh, I'm taking the existing prop adapter and a 3D printed part and some wood and I'm trying to kind of cobble it together into something that works. So long way around, I suppose. Probably not as efficient, but uh, hopefully it'll get the job done. All right, so this is the, the part where we do some weird woodworking. Uh, okay, so get some of this stuff out of the way. Let's see, so we've got uh, this existing piece here. Okay, yeah, so uh, this looks like it's one, two, three, four, five eighths. Uh, looks like this nub is five eighths long. So I'll just set that aside. Um, Let's see, and I've got this thing bottomed out inside the, uh, the carrier here. I learned, one of the first things that I learned when I was doing woodworking, when I was getting into it, was that you always make your measurements with a knife because uh, it's much more precise that way. So one, two, three, four, did I say five eighths? Dyslexia, man. One, two, three, four, five. Make my measurements right there. All right, make sure that measurement's okay. One, two, three, four, five, looks good. Okay, so at this point I'll just cut one and then, uh, and then I'll be able to use that one as a guide to cut the rest of them. I need to cut six of these. All right, so I'm gonna use my crappy Craftsman uh, dovetail saw and there's my mark right there. So I wanna keep this part of it, so I'm gonna try to cut on, on the other side of the mark. I'm unfortunately on the wrong side of the table for this. This is some weird combination of uh, hand tools and power tools, huh? 3D printer and then I'm using a dovetail saw. How weird is that? Just remembered I had this uh, little marking tool thing. Let me see if it works. I just want to try to keep my, my cut a little straighter. Not that it matters, I've got a little bit of play, a little bit of room down there, but just thought I'd try anyway. Okay, so same thing here. There's our first one. All right. That's two, three, four, five, Six. Okay, there all six of them are, and we'll just load them into the uh, cylinder here. They go in pretty easily. I could sand the bottoms down or something if I wanted to. Okay, and there we go. So that, in comparison to this, and I think this one's going to be much stronger because. You can, you can almost think of the layers in the 3D printed part as like grain in, a wo in wood. Uh, so in this case, the grains go this way down the length of the part. So if there's a shear force here, all of these layers are going to be resisting it. Whereas with this one, uh, if there's a shear force this way, only one single layer is going to be resisting it. So this should be a much stronger part. All right, and so at this point, I just thought, you know, I don't know if you can see that or not, but there's some rough, there are some rough edges on the ends of these dowels. So I just thought I'd clean them up a little bit with some sandpaper. I don't think it's really necessary, but why not? Okay, now that that's cleaned up, we'll uh, get on with some gluing. Okay, now prior to gluing, uh, I thought it'd maybe be a good idea if I marked these rings so that I know how far in they are. See, that one's too high. Kind of like a plumbing fitting, right? Because when you put plumbing together with, uh, with glue, plastic plumbing, you kind of want to make a mark so that you know that you've inserted it fully. So I'm just doing the same thing there. Makes it look a little ugly, but I don't really care. It's not about looks, it's about works. Okay, that should be good enough. 
And then I'm gonna take these out. I wanna make sure that I don't glue the end with the nub on it. I mean, I can always clear it, I can always clean it off with like a paper towel or something after I've put glue on it, but you know, just as much as possible, I wanna not get glue on the part that's supposed to stick out. Let's see if we can do this in one fell swoop here. It's kind of cold in here. It's uh, about 50 degrees right now, so glue is probably not working at its peak efficiency. No, nope, that's way too much. All this glue really has to do is keep the pin from coming out this way. It's not there for mechanical uh, stresses. It's not doing anything structurally to aid the part when it's under load. It's way too much. I'm gonna have to clean that up. All right, now let's see if we can clean that up a bit. I can always sand the glue down after it's dried. I just don't want to because it's gonna be so much more difficult to deal with when it's dry. It'd be much easier to clean it up when it's still wet and easy to work with. So it would look better for the camera if I were left-handed. Now, I have no idea if uh, wood glue and PLA plastic uh, are compatible or incompatible. You know, this could destroy my part for all I know, but I know that wood glue works with, uh, with wood, so <laughs> one out of two ain't bad, right? All right, so I'll leave that there and um, I'll just put something heavy on top of it. Heavy-ish, that'll do. Okay, and uh, we'll come back and see how that worked out later.